So I can see, Lucas, that uh, you've joined me in uh, just kicking it with a Hawaiian shirt today because it's very warm, yes? Yeah, it's that time of the year where the British people complain about heat wave and then everyone else tells them to shut the fuck up and then we yeah. have to explain about insulated houses. But we've already done that like many, many times in the past. We have indeed, but welcome folks at home to another episode of Wiki Week Days um, uh, with me, your host, Cal Smallwood, and as always, I'm joined my co-host, Lucas. Lucas Holland, you will. Lucas but Holland, I, you're using your full name now? I generally do. You've never used your full name before. I'm pretty sure, like, literally last podcast I introduced myself I think, with yeah. my full name. I think I noticed that then as well, because you always went by, you never used your full name in Fact Fiend stuff, but... Either way, yes, uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the format, uh, what me and Lucas like to do is go like to scour the internet for a wiki entry about something that we're interested in or would like to learn more about. Mm-hmm. And then we share it with you, our audience, and we let you at home decide which wiki won that week. So you're not deciding which one is the most interesting. Well, actually, I guess you are. So I guess it's not the thing that you personally find the most interesting, like if it's about superheroes or whatever, but just which one you think won in terms of like providing the most entertainment for that week regardless of its actual content i was gonna say yeah because it's not necessarily which wiki would be more interesting it's which wiki ended with the most interesting conversation would be yeah the that's best probably a better wiki. way of putting it yeah and uh, you know without further ado lucas uh, what wiki have you brought this week because uh, you mentioned something about a movie and i was like ooh, i a did movie. and um so you know i i was like People enjoyed the fact we we spent a bit of time talking about Spider Man when mm-hmm. Spider Man, uh, you know, was just coming out. So I figured, like, well, that Flash movie's just coming out soon. Oh, but no. I didn't want to talk about Snyderverse movies anymore, Carl. Okay. So instead, I decided to go and talk about like maybe one of the only things I'm interested in in the new Flash, which is Michael Keane's Batman. Okay, because I thought you were going to like go for a curveball and say, well, now we're going to cover Ezra Miller's wiki entry. I'm like, oh, no. See, I was, like, I was tempted to go down that route or I was tempted to go down, like, you know, talking about the DCEU or something. I was like, I am tired of having I'm those tired. conversations. So I'm just going to go to the wiki entry on Batman Returns. Which is Michael Keaton's... It's the sequel to the 1989 sequel? Batman where Michael Keaton stars in both, Tim Burton directs both. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just this was the one that I grew up a bit more familiar with, which is a bit Mm -hmm. fucked up considering this was the one that got a 15 rating. Yeah, and it's weird as well, because that movie series has, like, Michael Keaton just turn into Val Kilmer. (laughs) And they never explain it. There's not even, like, a little jab, like, with... um, with, uh, Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard, that's the one. Um, Yeah. And it's like... I'm here, deal with it, let's move on. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm wondering, though, if this move, if this wiki entry talks about the fact that Ezra Miller did have a cameo in those Batman movies. Do you know about this? No. Yeah, they had a really minor role. To find out more, Google Ezra Miller minor. Oh, for sake. <laughs> Sorry, I keep making that. I had to do it. Oh, I was like, I I- Ezra Miller must have been like two when these movies came out. I- I can't believe that like, they turned up to the fucking premiere and had the balls to sit there at the premiere and answer questions on the red carpet. And I believe they were quite tight-lipped and um, they essentially were just like, really thankful for like James Gunn and DC for basically um, not just pulling the rug from underneath me when it should rightfully be done so, really. Mm-hmm. Um, How could you pull a rug from Wonderstone who can run real fast? <laughs> you just keep going. Uh, uh, anyway, go you know, tell me more about this movie. I wanted to talk about Batman Returns because, yeah, Michael Keaton's Batman is, you know, iconic to many. Um, mm-hmm. 1992 is when this movie came out. It's as old as I am. And, yeah, this was one of the only interpretations of Batman I had growing up, including the animated series Batman. Yeah, that's two good Batman. Two very good as, Batman. As, yeah. as Batman go, that's like a solid, like you know, pairing of Batman. And then you know, my childhood self got introduced to Val Kilmer and George Clooney, and it's like, it's like why that- do I keep going back to the one where Danny DeVito bites someone's nose off? Oh, maybe that's why. The thing is, like, at least George Clooney Batman is interesting in that the movie was bad, but George Clooney himself is very charming. Mm. Val Kilmer Batman was just nothing. There was nothing to... I can't remember a single thing about Val Kilmer Batman. No, nothing at all. I can't remember a single line, a single scene, but I do remember 
um, like you know, the the what's his, I forget his name. I just I just said his name. George Clooney. George Clooney. I remember. Yeah. I remember George Clooney like you know the bad credit card. Never yeah, without it. I remember that bit because it felt as though Batman Forever had the villain tone of Batman and Robin, but the Batman tone was still trying to go from like the original yeah. to like Batman Returns and that. Like it, the Batman himself hadn't leaned into the camp yet in the Batman Forever. It's very strange. Maybe we can do one on that like um, uh, movie as well one day because that is a fascinating movie to like you know break down the production of but yeah I want to know more about Batman Returns well Carl Batman Returns is a 1992 American superhero film directed by Tim Burton of all people and written by Daniel Waters and obviously this is a follow up to the 1989 um, Batman film also starring Michael Keaton and directed by Tim Burton and just like the idea of Tim Burton being a superhero director, like, is really bold and interesting, especially like nineties and eighties Tim Burton. Yeah, but if you think about it, like Tim Burton's style, like he's always had like that very gothic, interesting mm-hmm. visual flair, which does suit Batman. Like you know, his, exactly. the look of his Batman movies informed what Batman was in the live action. So like you know a pretty remarkable degree like you know all that huge big imposing gothic architect uh, architecture like you know the silhouettes of batman with like the huge elongated pointed ears it's like all like you know to almost to the point of caricature and like you know the jack nicholson joker having the huge um uh, like you know exaggerated smile and he's like over the top performance and stuff like that yeah and i think one of the most interesting parts of those movies as you say is the the gothic architecture like the giant art deco gotham that they built is so iconic and memorable it is it's it's, it's, uh, like gotham is a character Mm -hmm. in those movies whereas it's like not really so much so in like later movies like those um uh, like later christopher nolan ones it's just chicago i've been to chicago and i was like they filmed batman here right and my my girlfriend at the time it's a little bit you know film noir gritty with a big wayne enterprises monorail but, going through it and stuff but it's it's just a dark gritty city and it is yeah it's not it's not like gargoyles everywhere and shit like that yeah. <laughs> um but yeah that's definitely one of the more memorable parts and i think yeah it, tim burton would probably be an awful choice for say a flash movie but for batman mm-hmm. specifically it worked really well especially with his visual style yeah like i said like the, that silhouette like that introduction and as well um like the outfit i said the big elongated ears with the, the lighting and the overdramatic acting that was kind of an accident, wasn't it? Of um, Michael Keaton, the outfit was the big rubber helm because he couldn't do anything but move his entire body. Yeah, but a, 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 a neat side effect of that is that Michael Keaton, Batman, is constantly moving in a very exaggerated fashion, which kind of like suits the world that like Tim Burton built, like the whoa, whoa. I mean, like, everything's just so dramatic and over the top. And it's, Batman's you know, always very, like, you know imposing and stood up in like a very strict manner almost but again that's just because the suit was really restrictive but yeah it creates this iconic look for batman as you say mm-hmm. like this huge imposing silhouette that's like constantly there and speaking of huge imposing silhouettes one of the enemies okay. in the movie is danny devito oh, and the no. penguin and i i think he does a really good bad job it might be one of the best bits of physical casting for a superhero movie. I don't think there's been a villain in a superhero movie as well cast as Danny DeVito Penguin until Willem Dafoe Joker. Uh, Willem Dafoe um, uh, Green, Green Goblin. Goblin. And, and, yeah. and Heath Ledger's Joker, of course. But, you know, that's that, goes without saying. It almo- Yeah, it almost is at a point where like you just have to assume that we've got Mentioned Heath it, Ledger's yeah. Joker already said because, yeah, that that's just an iconic performance. and It's Sold by Danny DeVito because I believe that man would go and bite someone's face off. Yeah, just the bit you always tell me about. So you mentioned it once, I had to look it up. He's like screaming as he goes down like the river of souls. And he's just... <laughs> like a fucking skeleton or something. And he has like, giant rubber ducky um, boat, which again, like throws in those really comical elements. and. Mm-hmm. It's like, it is this dark, weird thing where, like, yeah, you have Danny DeVito as this, like, horrible little penguin under the sewers and stuff, and it's, you know, He's like really raw horrible fish and, stuff. and gross, and yeah, like, eating raw fish and shit, but he gets on a giant rubber ducky boat as, like, his iconic penguin vehicle, it's like, 
Okay, you, you. It works though, doesn't it? It's like you know yeah. when Jack Nicholson pulls out the giant long gun. Yeah, it, it these works. created this world where both things make sense. That you have like the dark, brooding Batman, but you also have, which I guess is why it works so well, isn't it? You know they clash so heavily, visually, stylistically, um, with the design and look of Batman. Yeah, for sure. That it creates this like interesting visual um, palette. And um, yeah, we also are it. You know, the co-star of this movie is also the uh, the kind of anti-hero that is Selina Kyle, also known as Mich- Catwoman. And it's Michelle Pfeiffer, right? It's Michelle Pfeiffer pulling off an iconic role. Yeah, is, is she the best Catwoman? Has I there been a Catwoman the, better the than Michelle Pfeiffer? I mean, yeah, well, I mean, we've had a lot of Catwomen. We've had a lot, mentioned a lot of Batman. Um, Has I, anyone ever topped her performance? Because that's the thing is, um, Zoe Kravitz is technically Catwoman, but never mm-hmm. really comes across as much of a Catwoman to me in that the Batman movie. Mm-hmm. Um, she, you know, she kind of helps Batman a couple of times and they kiss and then she goes away, but she never really comes across it as like Catwoman. She also doesn't have like the whip skills that Michelle Pfeiffer did. No, no. And I, I guess you want to explain that, Carl. Uh, okay, so there is a... It's a pretty popular and well-known piece of trivia. Now, if we don't mention it, someone else will. Of course. In the comments, if we didn't know. But um, Michelle Pfeiffer did a lot of her own stunts in that movie. and was very proud of the fact she did a lot of her own stunts. And there is a behind-the-scenes bit of footage of Michelle Pfeiffer doing the whip scene where she whips the head off of three mannequins, Mm -hmm. which she did do for real. Yeah. And um, I think they have to cut around it in the actual take because an extra fucked it up by cheering. Yeah, you And Michelle Pfeiffer was really pissed about it. You see her pull it off, and like as she's finishing up the scene, you hear people in the background like cheering, and it's you know the behind the scenes shot of them yeah. filming the filming essentially. And it ruined the take, and they had to like awkwardly cut around it. I think in the final product, or it doesn't look like she did it in one take in the final product. And Michelle Pfeiffer was reportedly pissed as all hell about it because she actually did it for real, and no one believed her. And it's similar to that. Um... The basketball throw in Aliens, isn't it? Resurrection, yeah, where Stigoni Weaver did it for real and Ron Perlman ruined the shot. But yeah, she's like, <laughs> she's so good in that role. Yeah, she's great. And um, I think, you know, they go for one of those weird, tropey things. Of, oh, she's like a nerdy woman that's not hot. And then she gets the superpowers and all of a sudden she's like this hypersexualized <laughs> female character. Is it a trope, though? Because Batman kind of did it first. Well, that's that's like, it's a trope thing. now because they it keep is a trope doing that. Now. But that was one of the first superhero movies to do that. But I think if you know, watching it from the kind of the frame of someone looking back at tw- from twenty twenty three, it comes across as really tropey now for sure. But like, it is now a little bit cringy when you watch that scene. But then you're like, oh, but yeah, I can't remember one doing it first. Not to mention as well, it's been a thing in movies for years anyway. Of like the late, like it's a joke, isn't it? You take off the glass, the librarian taking off the glasses, and she's like a blonde bombshell underneath. Mm-hmm. Like wearing like you know, she's got the bookish looks and the big oversized sweater and stuff, like hiding the big badonkadonks. So it's not exactly you know uncommon to thing to see in film. I think in regards to superhero movies, it was Michelle Pfeiffer. But the idea they tried to like ugly up Michelle Pfeiffer, it's yeah. like <laughs> no chance. It's a tough so job. Fa- What's your favorite example then of a movie trying to like portray, like you know, a super hot actor or actress as ugly? Because they do it so much in superhero movies. Like, they do like I'm lot thinking lot. Amazing Spider-Man, where they try and portray Peter Parker as a like an unlovable nerd, and all three and that, of them are like attractive guys. Yeah, yeah. And is that there's not one second right by that like um, uh, Andrew Garfield is a nerd? Because that's the one that gets me is the Andrew Garfield one where. It was like they already had in mind that he needed to be like the cool jock Peter Parker afterwards, Mm -hmm. but forgot to do the bit beforehand where he's nerdy. Mm -hmm. And it's like they kind of do it where they're like, you know, he's obsessing over Gwen on the the screen and he's like taking photos and stuff. And Uncle Ben's taking the piss out of him a little bit for like liking this girl. But it never comes across that Andrew Garfield is not a cool guy. Yeah, so is, is there any of those for you? Because like, it's such a popular thing in superhero movies, isn't it? Like the transformation scene. Mm. And um, I'm just trying to... Because don't they do the same with Halle Berry? Isn't she th- in The Catwoman? 
she's I'm like not <laughs> this you know fashionista what? person that's like not meant to be like ugly necessarily, but meant to be just like this drab, boring woman. And then she turns into cat, and it's like Halle Berry. You really? know what they might have done. Joe, you know I bet no one knows because no one's watched that movie. <laughs> no one's watched it in ten years. They might have done it. We don't know. Because that's why I'm trying to think. I'm like pretty sure they did it then, but I, I never wanted now. to go and Halle, rewatch Halle Berry Catwoman. So while you continue, I'll Google it and I'll check for you. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Uh, so I'll just go through a brief description. So. In the film, the superhero vigilante Batman comes into conflict with wealthy industrialist Max Shrek. So Shrek makes his return on the podcast, Carl. And deformed (sighs) crime boss Oswald Cobblepot slash the Penguin, who seek power, influence, and respect regardless of the cost to Gotham City. Mm -hmm. Their plans are complicated by Selina Kyle, Shrek's formerly meek secretary, who seeks vengeance against Shrek as Catwoman. (laughs) The cast includes... Michael Keaton, Danny DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer, Christopher mm-hmm. Walken as Shrek, not the Shrek you're thinking of, Michael yeah. Goh, Pat Hingle, and Michael Murphy. Okay, so I, I that's all very interesting. But Luke, I did check, and they did try and make um, Halle Berry to be like the bookish. Um, I thought uh, they did. They did, but Lucas, look at what she, I've just sent Lucas a screenshot of like, <laughs> this is Halle Berry when she's supposed to be all frazzled. Oh, yeah. This is frazzled Halle Berry at the office when everyone's like, oh, you're such a, a dowdy, frumpy um, uh, piece of shit. No one's going to like you. It's like, Lucas, what do you see? Yeah, it's just Halle Berry being like, of course, attractive Halle Berry because she's always attractive. It's just Halle Berry. It is like, the, you can tell as well because they've given her like slightly curly hair. They've and tried to like frizzle for her a little bit, yeah. It's like, like she's been like you know at a desk all day, but she's got like immaculate makeup on and those like flawless cheekbones. Like I'm not falling for it. Yeah, and I think they tried to make it out like she's like this person who can't get a boyfriend and shit. And it's like, are you kidding me? This is <laughs> Halle fucking like, Berry. Yeah, Halle Berry would never get a boyfriend. But then again, admittedly, like the outfit she wears later as Catwoman, it is a pretty dramatic change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like, she does, like, you know, the character, the transformation she makes as a character from, like, you know, dowdy bookworm with frazzled hair overworked in an office Mm -hmm. to that, like, basically bra and knickers Catwoman outfit is very dramatic. It's just, I don't buy for one second that she's unattractive. Exactly, and that's why I, because I was pretty sure, but it's hard to remember because it's really hard to, like, downplay Halle Berry. It's it's also hard to remember Catwoman. you know, like, 20 years ago, Halle Berry, like, obviously she's still very attractive now, though, but... It's just like, yeah, they did. They did try to convince everybody that Halle Berry was like this ugly, frumpy woman that couldn't get a man or have friends. Yeah, I think my favorite example of that though is got to be the Mummy with like Rachel Weiss. Oh, uh, do they do that as well? Is, see, she looks hotter as the librarian. <laughs> because, <laughs> I don't know. She looks hotter when she's supposed to be like you know the dowdy, frumpy librarian. So like, she can still get it. Oh dear. <sighs> But man, what amazing cast. Danny DeVito was the Penguin. Mm-hmm. It's Colin Farrell now, right? Uh, yes, it is, yeah. And like, like, there's so much prosthetics that you can't even tell it's Colin Farrell. And it's at that point, why even hide? I still think they could have just brought Danny DeVito back. <laughs> that would be great. I still think they should. I think they should bring all the old actors back and give him another chance. I mean, they're doing that with Michael Keaton. So he's yeah. gone full circle. The Michael got- Keaton full circle of just like... I'm- I'm Batman. Then I'm making a parody version of constantly only being recognized for being Batman. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to become Birdman, and now I'm all the way back to Batman. Yeah, they had a brief stopover as the Vulture in between that. I I said Birdman as a parody version of Vulture, but then realized Uh, that Birdman is also the movie. Oh, no. But yeah, um, I'm like, I don't want to go watch The Flash in the cinema. I don't want to pay to go see that movie. I don't no. want to pay to endorse Ezra Miller uh, continuing to be part of that universe <laughs> after like the the numerous counts of like assault and robbery and shit that, and and other things, including what Carl told you to Google earlier. I'm just gonna say like I'm gonna describe the Flash the way I describe most DC movies. I'm going to watch it on a plane, <laughs> yeah. like because DC movies always end up on planes and they're always two and a half hours long and perfect for falling asleep to. You say that, Carl? I tried to do that with both Black Adam and Wonder Woman 1984, and I turned them both off. God, like, Black it wasn't Adam. even good enough to like play on my Switch and have on in the background. <laughs> Black Adam was like a slog to get through. 
It was painful to get I think through I got about film. half an hour into both movies and went, ah, no. Did the same with Aquaman as well, actually, yeah. They're just... Just noise. Yeah, and I, I'm really excited to get that nostalgia hit of, you know, Michael Keaton Batman, but they're not they're not tricking me into paying a cinema ticket for it. No, he shouldn't be saying I'm Batman, he should be saying I'm getting paid. Well, speaking of getting paid, <laughs> Let's the go. next line is, Burton had no interest in making a sequel to the successful Batman. Well, that's the one, isn't it? Because Batman was this huge, massive runaway hit. Like, no mm-hmm. one expected it to be a hit, and it made, like, $300 million, which doesn't sound like a lot. Now, that's the budget of a Batman movie now. But it yeah. made, like, I think 15 times its budget, and then made, like, 10 times like more in um, VHS sales. Well, here... It was insane. It says for Batman Returns, which I believe was a bit less successful, because uh, mm-hmm. it had a more mature rating, but it had a budget of 50 to $80 million and made $266.8 million. So See, five like, times its budget, yeah. Still four to five times its budget. Um, and then it said it be- he believed that it was creatively restricted by the expectations of Warner Bros. Mm-hmm. He agreed to return in exchange for the significant creative control, including replacing original writer Sam Hamm, great name, with a great Daniel one. Waters and hiring many of his previous creative collaborators. And I'm kind of surprised it wasn't just like... He agreed to return in exchange for $100 million or some shit, but at least it was something, like, because I know, for example, um, like Vin Diesel, like, turned up in Fast and Furious Toko Drift so that he could do Get the right yeah. films, mm-hmm. and I thought it would be something like that, but just, oh no, he just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a complete shit show only yeah. made to sell toys. The uh, thing is, though... With Burton, have been like, man, DC have got their two hands on with their projects. How little? I, that's the thing. If he just waited twenty years, <laughs> he could have like he could have done whatever the fuck he wanted. Yeah, he could have he could have done any movie he wanted to. DC didn't care. The Burton verse. The bar the Burton verse. Um, so Walter's script focused more on characterization than our overreaching, uh, overarching plot. Which does make sense because I really remember the characters and moments from that movie, but I don't really remember the plot. Mm-hmm. So not not overly knocking it because I still got a lot of good m- memories and nostalgia for that, but it does make sense when it says that. Yeah. Um. And then yeah, Wesley Strick was hired to complete an uncredited rewrite, which among other elements provided a master plan for the Penguin. Um, oh, says yeah. filming was done uh, September to February uh, 92, 91 to 92 on a 50 to 80 million dollar budget uh, and then you know boring bits and then says special effects primarily involved practical applications of makeup with some animatronics and CGI as well. Oh, I want animatronic Danny DeVito Penguin. <laughs> That's the, like, those I'm, effects I'm were real maybe good. Maybe the animatronics, like the little penguins or something, I can't remember. I think they were real. So I recall an interview with Danny DeVito when he talks about they smelled real bad. Oh, okay. They, apparently they kept shitting on him because he's quite short. So the penguins kept coming up to him thinking he was one of them. Hmm. Because obviously he's dressed like a penguin next to some penguins smelling like raw <laughs> meat or raw fish. So the penguins kept shitting on him. Well, I've just scrolled down, Colin. It says here for development... You are right, Batman was a runaway success because it says it after the success of Batman nineteen eighty nine, the fifth highest grossing of its time. Yeah, I've got it in front of me here of like you know, just some details for anyone who's curious, like four hundred and eleven million on a forty eight million budget, so almost ten times its production budget. And it wasn't expected to make this much money. Yeah, exactly. And then it says um it's the, the, it's the first big superhero movie. So basically, this kicks oh, yeah. it all off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You had movies before this, but this is what kicked off. You would not have Marvel, you would not have the MCU, you would not have Spider-Man, you would not have the Nolanverse like, without this. That big, the fifth highest grossing movie of its time, like, that is nothing to fucking, you know, throw away, you know. It's just, that's ridiculous. I didn't realise how successful that was. Yeah, not to mention as well, I... I think even its soundtrack went platinum because Prince did the soundtrack, do you remember? Did he? Yeah, I Prince just is on the soundtrack. It was like a Danny Elfman soundtrack. It was Danny Elfman, but Prince was there as well. So the right. the the, al- the album associated with the movie went platinum, which also made them a shit ton of money. Mm. Which is why, obviously, the next one, presumably it's the music, was like going to be a bunch of like extra music things they got in for that. 
but yeah, it just says like the the studio had purchased the two million dollar Gotham City set at Pinewood Studios in England for at least two sequels. Um, they just bought the set. Yeah, they bought the set and it kept under twenty four hour guard because it was cheaper to maintain the set than build new ones. Yeah, because that's thing. Like, um, do you ever see what they did for the Nolan movies though? Because like, Joey's like really into his practical effects. Of course, yeah. yeah. Do you like the Batcave? Hmm. They built that. Wow. Like, they, okay. they built a bat cave. It's not out of rock, but what they did is... Yeah. And keep in mind as well, the bat cave scenes are all, at like, underground, so it's mm. dark. They built, like, a big, I think, like, a 100-foot-high fake rock wall, oh, sure. painted it to look like rocks, and then ran water down it constantly. Canal. Because Christopher Nolan is a madman. Yeah. <laughs> He's a mad... I like the idea, though, that they built... The back, they built Gotham and like had it under armed guard, which made, must have made it look more like Gotham just guys with guns walking <laughs> everywhere. They should have made it really meta and had them dress like Joker goons or something like that. Oh, God. But uh, this is something I did not know about the movie, Carl. Okay, drop the, it on Alongside me. Danny DeVito, Robin Williams was considered to play the rogue, the Riddler. That would have been real good. I, could, I can only imagine I can that going see it. well. Yeah. Well, can you think of a Robin Williams role where he didn't do amazing? Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, um, you know, oh, Jack Nicholson is the Joker. the Riddler as well. Yeah. Like, obviously. He'd be a real good Riddler. We've got Jim Carrey's Riddler, and that was very good. over the top. He and was like, good for good the film he was in. Yeah. He just clashed horribly with Tommy Lee Jones. Yes. Famously, yes. And, um, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Robin Williams would play a good Riddler. But I would maybe have liked to, again, seen him in a more comical, over-the-top version, whereas this maybe would have been a bit more of a downplayed Riddler. Definitely less so than the fucking the Batman one, where it doesn't even feel like the Riddler. He just shoots people. <laughs> he's, he's, the, he's, he's, just, he's the ultimate riddle, just shooting people in the back. Just blows people up. Yeah. Just tells other people to murder people. So it's the best. It's the, it's the ultimate riddle, Lucas. Just shooting people in the back. And oh, what's the uh, the one where they think they've solved it, and then in the end, it just turns out to be like a website. I don't remember it, the the thing turns out to be like URL or something like that. But anyway, oh yeah, oh no, I'm gonna, oh not gonna piss me off. That's now. the Batman. We don't need to worry about the Batman. Okay. Um, so I'll go down to music since you mentioned Prince. Um, yeah, because like, I think Prince was he did a soundtrack to Batman 1989, and mm. like that album went platinum. Prince yes. has like a platinum album because he was on that. It does say, uh, yeah. Danny Elfman was initially reluctant to score Batman Returns because he was unhappy that his Batman score was supplemented with pop music by Prince. Who the fuck is out there going, oh, I'm really disappointed that my sound I had to work with Prince? But it doesn't sound like he worked with Prince necessarily. Oh. Just that, he, yeah, I would assume from saying that his music was supplemented with pop music by Prince. Even still, just having your name next to Prince's. But it's Danny You've... Elfman, and I think Danny Elfman is like a very controlling person, like very talented. Of oh, course, yeah. Like, when you go about going stuff like that, he wants you know his shit to be his shit. That's fair. So I can imagine being told like, yeah, you've got the soundtrack to this movie, and it's like. Okay, yeah, it's fucking Prince, but at the end of the day, they just scrub some of his soundtrack for pop music. Yeah, it's, and maybe it, I that's get the it. way he he sees it. So I get, I can kind of get it, but also I, it's fucking Prince. Yeah, like when the purple one comes a calling, <laughs> you just sit there and let him do it, like, let him do his thing. Um, Elfman built on many of his Batman themes, and he said that he enjoyed working on the Penguin's themes the most because of the char- character's sympathetic aspects, such as his abandonment and death. Well, that's the thing is, like, Danny Elfman has been ripping off that Batman theme for the past 20 years. Have well, you ever heard, like, the... It's so real good. good Batman theme. But have you ever heard, like, the Batman theme next to his Spider-Man theme? And mm-hmm. it's like, ooh. And it, it's, it's, there's, it's, there's shades of, can I copy your homework? It's like, just change a few words. It's copying his own homework. It is, yeah. And I, I kind of respect the hustle of, like, barely changing your own music and then getting paid millions to sell it onto a different company. Like, why not? But, yeah, that's a... Uh, you know, it's a good theme, again, but it's like it's over. It's overshadowed it's a lot of his later work. I'd say. Yeah, you have to kind of, um, I guess, keep your signature sound as a composer. Or you don't have to, but 
you know, you can generally tell when Danny Elfman has scored something. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you don't want to stray too close to your own work. I get it. But yeah, uh, I mean, let let me just scroll down a bit here because we're getting a bit long in the tooth on our wiki. Yeah, I was going to say, just didn't, because I was wondering, was it Seal who worked on the sequel? Or was that like another sequel? That's six. I know there's a Batman movie that Seal worked on. It doesn't mention, it's only like one paragraph on music. Oh, right? does it not mention? So they must not have got any pop music. That must have been part of his like deal then. So I have like uh, less pop music put in that one. At least I don't think it is. No, it just talks about like... Um, Oh, no, okay, yeah. Um, it does say right at the very end, because I just skipped it because it started going, like, you know, mm-hmm. um, through his orchestra and stuff, but it does say the song Face to Face was played during the costume ball scene, which uh, was performed by the British rock band... I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it, like... Is it Susie and the Banshees? Oh, yeah, Susie and the Banshees, yeah. Is that how you pronounce that name? I think so, yeah. Mum's a fan. Because it's like S I S O I X E S I E, and it's like yeah. okay, but yeah, I, there's that one note of a uh, music there, but yeah, the rest, most of the rest of the paragraph is just talking about like you know how we orchestrated it and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I guess we can just finish on like what the critical response was because I'm genuinely interested to know like how this movie actually was received at the time. Yeah, because that's one of the things like oh, so it's widely held, it's held in wide regard now. But what was it like at the time? What were the contemporary reviews like? It does say it has a polarized reception from professional critics. Uh, audiences polled by Cinema Score gave the film an average grade of B on an A plus to F scale. Not uh, bad. Several reviewers compared Batman Returns and Batman. Some suggested the sequel had faster pacing, more comedy and depth, and avoided Batman's dourness and tedium. Um, they generally agreed that cr- like Burton's creative control made Batman Returns a more personal work than Batman. Something that feels something fearlessly, something fearlessly different, which could be judged on its own merits. Mm-hmm. But uh, he definitely put his stamp on that series, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure, and he definitely did a better job of me trying to read that sentence a second ago. But yeah, it it seems as though you know, just kind of a lot of people were kind of impressed with his work and. It just had a bit of a mixed response, but maybe mixed to positive from yep. the critics. Um, How can you not want least, like Danny DeVito? Just at very least, you know, the fuck up. Obviously making sure that Burton gets his credit for making something that feels more like a Burton movie. Probably maybe, one of his last good movies. Yeah, yeah. Because um, if people aren't aware that kind of, you know, from... This millennia, Tim Burton hasn't like, actively directed many projects, so he's more been a producer for the most part, and a lot of the stuff that he has directed has been a mm-hmm. bit weaker. It's also than... worth noting as well, he isn't like a noted raging arsehole on almost all the movies he works on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, Apparently yeah, so, yeah. The other story about him on uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, which he, like, he basically gets the credit for, but he was a producer, not a director. But it like was based in. off his original work and then he became producer, right? Yeah, but he walked mm-hmm. in one day, yelled at all the crew for not doing it quick enough and kicked a hole in the wall. Which, you know, of course is going to help things get along a lot smoother. Yeah. Um, but I just thought it was just one of those things. Yeah, and obviously he's, he's had a very good career, but a lot of the things he's given credit for he has been producer on and then... A lot of the things he's directed very well are like back in the eighties and nineties. Mm-hmm. Well, either way, like no, what an influential and um, uh, impactful film. Yeah, for sure. And uh, between those first two Tim Burton Batman movies, just I don't know if we would have any semblance of a superhero film market, let alone to the extent we do at this point. Like, I don't even know whether things like. Spider-Man and X-Men would have been made if it weren't for these two movies. We wouldn't have like the glut of sequels and stuff we have now either. Mm. So it basically kicked off the idea of like serialized films. So obviously there were always sequels to movies, like usually direct to video. But like there the, was four Batman movies all four in the Batman theater. movies that were generally meant to be in the same universe, even though yeah. the Batman kept changing and the tone kept changing, but 
but they were all same universe and you know widespread theatrical releases. Mm-hmm. When previously, like, you know, most sequels would either be like you know years later, you'd have one maybe, or it'd, be, and it'd most likely be direct to video. But this Batman was changed all that. Movies in eight years, and especially the last two, hyper commercialized. You know, toys everywhere. McDonald's, oh, out of the fucking was toys, Like people still want those Batman glasses. I still want those Batman glasses. Those, those people still talk about those Batman glasses you got from mcdonald's like they're now have you seen that they started turning up on like the antique road show i'm not surprised because they're collectible as fuck that and pokemon cards are now on the antiques road show everyone oh yeah and if you're not sure what we're talking about just google like the batman 90s glasses like as they in, look like, so cool glasses because i keep you know mentioning that i might edit these but i always I'm forget to google them and look at them pictures in them. halfway through a podcast because you know like, it might be one of the best, you, but... one of the best giveaways McDonald's ever did. They look, oh, they look so rad. They look so rad, and they were McDonald's glasses, weren't they? Yeah. Yep, McDonald's, McDonald's giveaway. And this was back in the day when I think they were genuine glass and not just plastic. Yep, they were glass, and if you put them in the freezer, um, like you have the design of like the Joker and stuff on there, and the mm-hmm. outline of the frost had created the outline of the character. And it's like this oh! was for. That was the Batman and Robin movie that was, wasn't it? So it was mm-hmm. Mr. Freeze was the entire point, yeah. Oh, so good. Bring back Arnie. Why Why is Arnold Schwarzenegger not coming in as Mr. Freeze for the Flash so that he can essentially be Captain Cold in that they universe? Just, like, oh. like, they should just say, fuck it. Bring them all back. Bring up back all of the now, like, what, 60-year-old men just, and just re- replace Henry Cavill with Christopher Reeve doing it. Like, obviously not. But... Just CGI him in. Who gives a fuck? Yeah, just... Nowadays, we can just put him back in. <laughs> oh, we can't. Just... I do wonder, are they going to CGI someone in? At some point, they're going to. I mean, they've already done it in Star Wars, where Mark Hamill was like, I didn't even know I was in Mandalorian. They just <laughs> put my model and used my old voice clips. I didn't even need to be involved i just don't get a paycheck now great it's like great thanks so realistically they could do it i can't wait oh but anyway we've talked for nearly 40 minutes on batman forever we could talk that's no, we talked about returns, batman forever for we've almost. nearly talked about batman returns forever forever so i guess what we can do now carl is we yes. can take a little break Okay, and we're going to return, refreshed, renewed, um, presumably with like you know a fresh um, uh, beverage and some renewed zeal to talk Great. about my wiki entry for this week. Yeah, I'm going to go blast a fan in my face to stop myself from sweating so much. I'm going to go get a cup of tea. So we'll be right back. Whoa, so, Lucas, what beverage have you gotten after our you know brief but required break? I mean, I literally just added more ice back into my squash to just make it colder again. I've got a nice, lovely hot cup of tea because, you know, I'm a northern <laughs> lad and all I can think when it's warm is that Peter K bit of, Mum, Mum, I'm dying, I'm dying, have a cup of tea. <laughs> it, do, it does help, but it's mostly psychological. And uh, before we get into my, my wiki entry, um, uh, if folks at home, if you're enjoying this, first of all, you know, thank you for sticking with us, but maybe you'd like to um, uh, just do more than just passively observe and actively help create an episode of Wiki Weekends, which you can do by that, you know, leaving comments below, contacting us on social media, which is also linked below, or perhaps sponsoring an episode. And where could they do that, Lucas? Uh, well, they can contact us at wikiweekends at gmail.com, which will just be in the description below as well. Mm-hmm. And if you do that, you can, like, you know, sponsor an episode or, you know, reach out to us with, like, you know, feedback or comments. Of course. You know, which we yeah. do welcome because, you know, uh, every little helps. Yeah, try to, to stick to, like, reaching out on the email with, you know, offers for, for sponsors and stuff, not just commenting what you would below instead. Like, please yeah, don't just if, send us comments directly. If you want to give us ideas for stuff to cover, like, maybe that's a social media or a comment thing. If you've mm-hmm. got, like, something that's more related to feedback on the channel itself or errors we may have made or, you know, feedback on something a bit more specific or constructive, maybe that can um, take place in the emails. Of course, yeah, and uh, apologies if my audio was just antsy for a second there. I forgot to turn my fan back off, so audio may just be not so squeaky clean for that minute or so. So apologies, uh-huh. but Carl, speaking of squeaky clean, I don't yes. know where this is going. What's your wiki for this week? 
Well, I've decided that I'm going to talk about something that I love. And you mentioned, you know, a part of both of our childhoods. I remember, not those Batman movies, but I remember the experience that was surrounding those Batman movies. Because, like, mm. we briefly touched on right at the end there, like, the glasses that were released with song- alongside Batman. Because those movies were marketing juggernauts. I there was so it. much Batman stuff in, like, you know, the lead up to those movies coming out. And as someone who lived in a small northern town, I got a lot of hand me down Batman toys. Yeah, and it was especially the Joel Schumacher too, because yeah. Tim Burton, as mentioned earlier, like really didn't want to come back and do this like hyper commercialized thing. How times have changed, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Joel Schumacher was all in, and that's when you had like you know Ninja Assault Batman and like you know Batman with his bat skates and like fifteen different Batman. Bits. I distinctly recall a neighbor moved out from a house nearby me and just left like big bags of stuff outside their house for the bin men to take, just full of all their kids' toys that they didn't want. Mm-hmm. And me and my brother went in there and we found like I want to say probably worth now hundreds of pounds worth of Batman <laughs> stuff. Like we but got like obviously- four Batmobiles. It's it's one of those things of like, well, you're a kid. What are you gonna do? You're gonna play with it and destroy those shit. Like mm-hmm. the, you know, it's one of those things of obviously like hindsight is twenty twenty and like, yeah, sure. I kind of wish like, I guess I kept that Charizard card in pristine condition or whatever. But yeah, I also enjoyed you know being a child. And enjoying myself and playing with my Pokemon cards. It's also that thing as well of if everyone thought to save everything, then it wouldn't be worth what it is now. But you know, exactly. in relation to things that I enjoyed from my childhood, let's talk about dinosaurs. Specifically, one very specific dinosaur, and that is Rexy. And do you want to just hazard a guess, Lucas? You want to use your powers of deduction to guess what kind of dinosaur Rexy is? Um, I'm going to... Take a wild swing here. Okay, Say wild shot in the dark. Probably a T-Rex, but I'm very surprised because I don't know who Rexy the dinosaur is. Well, Rexy the T-Rex is the name given to the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. Oh, right, okay, yeah. So, so I'm aware people... of that. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm aware of the, the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. I just was not aware they were called Rexy. And are you aware that it's the same T-Rex in all of the movies, except for the second one, which is a new T-Rex? So the T-Rex that comes back to help in Jurassic World is canonically the same T-Rex. Uh, the one in Jurassic was a new T-Rex, but that new T-Rex is intro- meets the um, old T-Rex. So it's no, very confusing. What, I mean, like, uh, the, uh, what I meant was the T-Rex that comes to help kill the big mutant one. Mm-hmm. Is that the original T-Rex? That's the original T-Rex, yeah. So, uh, you know, for anyone else who's like Luke, is very confused. Let's uh, refer to the Jurassic Park wiki here. Rexy, also known as Roberta, is a Tyrannosaurus Rex and the heroine and main dinosaur protagonist of the Jurassic Park franchise, which is stupid, but it kind of is. The T-Rex is the star. The, the T-Rex is the star and the heroine. And the mascot. And the mascot, the only thing... You don't see Chris Pratt's face put on a Jurassic Park t-shirt. Well, yeah. you, you do see the Jurassic Park logo with the Rex well, on it. Well, I quickly read through this, and you know the, gira- the T-Rex on the logo? That is this T-Rex's ancestor. Oh. So it's like, you know, it's ancestor. It's like the, that T-Rex is like, it's the mascot and main character of the series, but we have here, so... Uh, <laughs> Serving as a major former antagonist of the original Jurassic Park film, who became a hero towards the end of it, a supporting protagonist in Jurassic World and a minor character in Jurassic World um, Fallen Kingdom. It's just, I, I love it. I, I, again, that is all very true, but it just comes across as more comedic when it's the T Rex <laughs> that's just, you know, running around and chomping on things. It's when I'm describing a dinosaur as a protagonist. It's very funny, isn't it? It's like we're talking about like the land before time or something like that. I'm like, yeah. where's Sharp Tooth come into this? And then finally, <laughs> the main dinosaur protagonist of Jurassic World Dominion. So the T-Rex in Lost World is distinctly not Rexy, but is a dinosaur that has its own backstory and does meet Rexy. So I think at the end of Dominion, or Fallen Kingdom, you see the dinosaur, like the T Rex roar, and two more T Rexes turn up, and those uh, have been confirmed to be the T Rexes from Jurassic World. So, 
Yeah, because Jurassic Park... Jurassic World, sorry, Jurassic, World, um, Jurassic Park Lost World. Yes. Because um, Lost World, is that the one where they take a T-Rex to the city? To the city. Yeah. And yeah, just so. shit gets real bad. <laughs> Mom, there's a dinosaur in the backyard, and it's like, go to sleep, honey, and there's a dinosaur in the backyard. It's, it's one of the best it, line reads in any... It's one of the best line reads from a kid actor. It's just... Did none of them ever watch King Kong and go maybe taking this gigantic beast into the middle of a city is a bad idea? Oh, no. But you can't control nature, can you? They keep thinking they can, though. But we have here of um, uh, just some biographical information about Rexy, the uh, the Tyrannosaurus Rex protagonist of Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, so appearances, Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom, um, a bunch of, like, Comics and side material, of course. A bunch of video games. Um, the Jurassic Park um, uh, Camp Cretaceous series, in which he plays like you know an antagonistic role. And then species Tyrannosaurus Rex. Which Lucas, do you know what Tyrannosaurus Rex means? And this is why Tyrannosaurus Rex will always be the coolest dinosaur. Hang on, no, you said that other dinosaurs are the coolest dinosaur before Carl. No, but this is the coolest named dinosaur. Oh, okay, because I. And- Distinctly remember you saying that you prefer um, Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurus, yeah. Yeah, that's my um, favourite dinosaur. But the coolest dinosaur name belongs to the T Rex, and I feel bad for every subsequent dinosaur discovered after the T Rex that, like scientists realised, was probably bigger and stronger than the T Rex. Because you know, like they keep saying, like, with it, oh, there's a new dinosaur. It's like the Gigantosaurus. It's stronger than a T Rex, and it's like, but it's not T Rex, is it? <laughs> or a Spinosaurus. It's like, bro, that sounds stupid. So, so do, what do, does T-Rex mean? So I'm not, I'm not aware. It means, Lucas, and this is the band name right here, Tyrant Lizard King. Wow. So to, like, That's the thing. They fucking nailed it when they named <laughs> the T-Rex. And that's the thing. Since the T-Rex's discovery, there's been other bigger carnivorous dinosaurs that have experts have said well, yeah in a in a fight or if they met in the wild which they probably wouldn't from different eras millions of years apart but this one new dinosaur is bigger than a t-rex but because the t-rex is so synonymous in people's minds with like just big it's like the king of the dinosaurs mm-hmm. and its name is the coolest and its name literally translates to tyrant lizard king <laughs> you always feel well. bad don't you i do feel bad but i also feel a little bit bad with you know, the new discoveries they've made over time where now they're theorizing that dinosaurs were more bird like than lizard like and it's Yeah. It's now means that he's the king of the lizards, but or they are king of the lizards, but like the all Tyrannosauruses are named incorrectly now, I guess. Yeah. Maybe and, this, and here's where I, I have to do something. I I know and I believe when experts say things like the Tyrannosaurus Rex most likely had feathers. It was most likely a scavenger. It was most likely, you know, it nurtured its young and all that good stuff. Like, But in my head, I'm like, nah. It's well, like it is in Jurassic Park because just to me, that's objectively cooler. I don't, I'm not disagreeing with what the scientists and experts mm-hmm. say. I'm just saying that I would ra- I'd be okay if they were wrong. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things that we grew up with Jurassic Park, with books, with museums, mm-hmm. everything depicting all across all media we had, you know, walking with the dinosaurs and everything. All of it told us that dinosaurs look this way like they do in Jurassic mm-hmm. Park. And it's really hard to unlearn a mental image that you've built from birth for twenty five years and then they're like, No, they were more like birds. It's like yep. Okay, but I'm not gonna be able to picture that when someone says the word dinosaur to because me. when i think dinosaur i think a t-rex and it, yeah, because again, of Jurassic it's not Park. i don't believe them or think that they are correct it's just that my brain cannot be like changed that way i get like i still memorize it like i do a jurassic park dinosaur. yeah and, and they acknowledge that in this so we have here it's like so just lucas for anyone unfamiliar with the tyrannosaurus rex as like you know basic biographical information and statistics um, like other tyrannosaurids Tyrannosaurus was a bipedal carnivore with a massive skull balanced by a long, heavy tail. Relative to its large, um, uh, powerful hind limbs, the forelimbs of the Tyrannosaurus were short but unusually powerful for their size. Because that's the joke everyone always makes, isn't it? Like that, but it's like, but this thing's like still like fifteen feet tall, and also they were very good at 
like shredding up the bodies that mm-hmm. they like already killed and stuff. So they did do their job well. It's just that it looks a bit silly and stumpy. Yeah, and it says here that um, despite the discovery of other larger dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus rex is, by size, among the largest known land predators. And it is estimated to have exerted the strongest bite force among all terrestrial animals known. Doesn't surprise me, but still. Yeah. Um, It was likely an apex predator and well and truly earned its title of King of the Dinosaurs. (laughs) Um, I just love it though. It's, it's, it's just it's so fucking cool. It's so cool. That's the thing is like you know we can talk about like the the birds and all this, and but most of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs wouldn't have been around in the Jurassic era yeah. and all this. You know, most of us. Like, that's the joke, isn't it? Yeah. Stuff and like, but at the end of the day, Rex is just fucking cool. Yeah, like mo- the joke that people always make, at least if they know anything about paleontology, is that most of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park don't come from the Jurassic period. But Jurassic Park as a commercialized park name mm-hmm. or a theme park with dinosaurs in it, that makes perfect sense because people, most of them won't know. It's just, hey, it's called Jurassic Park because it sounds cool and you know that that's associated with dinosaurs. Yeah. But Luke, are you ready for some like some extra knowledge to be dropped right now? In the early 2020s, new research and studies have increased people's overall knowledge and understanding of this particularly famous dinosaur. In March 2022, for example, studies revealed that there are three species of Tyrannosaurus. So, you know, different kinds of Tyrannosaurus, um, uh, like, you know, which was uh, indicated by the different femurs and teeth incisors. The two other species of Tyrannosaurus are known as Tyrannosaurus Imperator, which translates to Tyrant Lizard Emperor, <laughs> and Tyrannosaurus Regina, Tyrant Lizard Queen. We stan our Tyrant Lizard Queen. Fuck yeah. And is that saying that that's within the world of Jurassic Park, or is that saying, no, in, like, in our world? In our world, okay. Yeah. So with this being a page on Rexy, it's hard to clarify what's like actually scientific and what's made up bullshit. Yeah. From like this, world. this first bit is just like information about the Tyrannosaurus Rex as a dinosaur, and then it's like more specifically about this particular Tyrannosaurus Rex in the Jurassic Park mm-hmm. universe. And then just first, finally, because this is like hilarious. Um, uh, da, 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 another study. Um, uh, in late 2022, suggests that the Tyrannosaurus Rex may have been 20, uh, 70% bigger than previously thought and could have weighed up to 15 tons. Oh. <laughs> this new estimate um, suggests that the Tyrannosaurus could also have been much more intelligent than previously thought, with uh, its intelligence state to be on par with a modern baboon. Okay. Furthermore, it was estimated that there were approximately 1.7 billion Tyrannosauruses present on Earth. At the height of their reign. So roughly a quarter of the population. Yeah, one billion Tyrannosaurus Rexes. That's a lot of T-Rexes. Closer to two billion. That's like, again, that's what the population of India or something. Yeah. Or China, maybe. I'm not sure, but you know. That's a lot of T-Rexes. It's a lot. Imagine that. So imagine a, what would you do, Lucas, if like you're there, you go back in your time machine, and a billion T-Rexes turn up. <laughs> <laughs> you just fucked out, yeah. Who who would win? One point seven billion T-Rexes or Batman with prep time? <laughs> <laughs> have we ever talked about that moment when me, you, and our mutual friend absolutely lost our shit <laughs> when I brought up that shit post on Reddit of what would win? <laughs> One trillion lions or the sun. <laughs> and we just we couldn't handle the idea of just a trillion lions attacking the sun. Uh and it, it you know that that came off the uh, the conversation of like Batman could be anyone um, oh, yeah, with you, prep you... time and it was like someone arguing that Batman could defeat Wonder from the MCU. Yeah. Like um the Scarlet Witch with prep time and it's like and I... <laughs> And I think it was either me or our mutual friend just said, all what Scarlet would have to do is just say, no more Batman. <laughs> just, <laughs> That's the fight. Just no more Batman. Uh, yeah, I anyway. see what he can do against 1.7 billion Tyrannosaurus Rex. 
Anyway, so characteristics of Rexy in particular, unlike the original T-Rexes, T-Rex clones have been known to see only movements due to the mixture of frog DNA. Ah, okay, so mod like you know actual t-rexes in our world probably could see fine but in the jurassic park universe to explain away the fact that science has like debunked that particular myth like you know theory they say oh no just because of their dna they can't see very well yeah and that's the thing in jurassic park isn't it that they explain is well we have the dna from the mosquitoes in Mm -hmm. the amber but then we need to like mix that in with dna of like modern animals and like frogs and stuff like that yeah and i kind of so, like that as the jurassic park series has gone on um and as science has caught up and like you know, our understanding of what t-rex is what actually like has changed they've wrote stuff into the movies of like yeah because i think they even have a line with dr Wu where he straight up says these these creatures don't look anything like dinosaurs would they're genetic abominations that were cobbled together from scraps we had left on the um the floor mm-hmm. and it, like you know it says here the uh Unlike an actual T-Rex, um, clone T-Rexes could live longer um, uh, than the estimated lifespan of a T-Rex um, uh, in its natural habitat in the wild, and also could run slightly faster. I just want to see them doing little frog jumps. Well, it says here that, yeah. um, it, in its past, um, uh, in the late Cretaceous period, a feathered Tyrannosaurus rex fought a Gigantosaurus, was killed in the battle, a mosquito fed on its blood, which would later be used by InGen in the cloning of the species. Right. And the cloning process is mentioned here. Um, made some alterations to the T-Rex design, including removing the feathers. And I think that is a very clever way to get around the whole situation where, yeah, of course, we messed with their DNA to make them look more imposing because it's a commercialized theme park. We yep. want to make them as cool looking as possible. And then they go on to make the... Um, the, like their own dinosaurs, which are even bigger and cooler and more yeah. dangerous. But the fact that you know, with the it's one of those times where I don't mind them, like George Lucas in it up a little bit mm-hmm. and rewriting stuff because you know history has you know, like the science at the time that they made the film is like now now pretty conclusively proven to be wrong. So yeah. it, it makes like their ostensibly science based premise seem kind of weak. Yeah, it makes you look at the the basis of those movies and go, well, they're inherently wrong. And then you can have the character be like, we know it's wrong, but, you know... Stop complaining about of, it on Twitter. We kind of need to just brush this off because we didn't know that 20 years ago when we made Jurassic Park. No. Leave us alone. It, and it even says here, like, presumably, like, you know, this was mentioned like a comic or something like that, that there was a feathered Tyrannosaurus and that's where the blood for Rexy came from. But mm-hmm. it mentions here that in Jurassic Park, obviously we all know. And here's the behind-the-scenes stuff that people maybe don't know, is that originally that T-Rex was supposed to turn up that one scene. It cost a fucking fortune like the in CGI. The scene in the rain. The scene in the rain, the CGI budget. I think the uh, Steven Spielberg said that scene cost $15,000 per second. Every, <laughs> every second the T-Rex was on screen was $15,000. Just hell. in rendering costs alone. Like, that's not including, like, you know, the cost of all the actors and the sets and stuff. Like, in rendering and costs alone, the T-Rex cost $15,000 And on top per of that, second. the giant fucking animatronic that they had to build and, Which like, also, yeah. broke apart on set and all this. And it was, like, this one of the biggest things they, like, ever made animatronics-wise. Yeah, they literally had to raise the roof of Stan Winston Studios because the T-Rex wouldn't fit inside. And... Because it was such a ball ache, they weren't going to put the T-Rex back in until Steven Spielberg's like, hang on a second. Because the ending was just supposed to be they them baseball batting raptors. And just and Steven Spielberg's like, no, nah, yeah. we've got to bring the T-Rex back. The T-Rex is the hero of the movie. We have to bring it back. There's no way that you can end a dramatic Steven Spielberg movie with a, I guess we hit a couple of raptors and ran away. It's like, you don't have a big moment to sell the, the ending, right? And I contend the scene of the T-Rex roaring as just like the the banner of like when dinosaurs rule. It's one of the best shots <laughs> in like any blockbuster. It's it so really good. It really is. And you know what? Everyone in the comments, it makes up for the fact that they don't hear her coming, okay? Yeah. It, it causes earthquakes in the previous scene. Well, like, you know what? That's Spielberg's directing skill it's on display magic. right there. Yeah. Like, he's so good at directing. That's one of those things that when it's pointed out, yeah, 
Well, at the time, did you notice it? No, because you were enthralled by the story. You don't notice that the 15-ton earthquake-creating T-Rex <laughs> suddenly sneaks up on the Velociraptors. It's just, it's a hype moment that sells the end of that film, and that's all you really care about when you're watching it. Yeah, it's like if you go back and rewatch watch um, uh, uh, that fight scene, like you go back and you watch it, um, you'll notice that there is a, uh, a shot of one of the raptors where it just stands still. <laughs> like you'll know if you look at like you know the raptors on the edge of frame a lot of them don't move but you There's don't know your eyes is drawn to the action yeah very clever workarounds in that movie and like just again everything that steven spielberg was able to pull off with mm-hmm. basically you know they had to essentially create entire new things for this movie oh yeah it's, it's insane and it's obviously there's so much that can be said on the production of this movie and the, the Alone, shit they yeah. had to do with the the T Rex and the CGI and the puppetry and everything—it's insane that this movie existed. It is, but bringing it back to Rexy, behavioral characteristics. Rexy was the largest carnivore on Isla Nublar. As such, she is a fearless, bold, powerful, domineering <laughs> beast that walks the line between heroine and villainess. Fuck yeah. Listen to this description. This is a dinosaur. <laughs> Largely motivated by two goals, keep intruders off her territory and eat any prey she finds. Even at 20 plus years of age. Look at that. An icon. 20 years of age and still kicking. Uh, she was relentless and very vigorous, as a lot of you know girls in their 20s usually are. <laughs> she was shown roaring and launching herself at the Indominus Rex at the first instant she saw it. <laughs> she also appeared to be fairly efficient at stealth. Yeah, so yeah. stealth. That's uh, in the powers and abilities. Does it say like super secret stealth cloak or something? Well, let's find out. We have a couple of like um, uh, things here. We have like physical appearance and behavioral character. Physical appearance is it's a dinosaur, and we've covered bits of the story and background on the T Rex species. But like, I think we should just go to like the trivia and behind the scenes because there's cool. like a bunch of dumb stuff there. Let's Unless you've got it. more to say about the T Rex, because like you just we know it turns up and it kicks everyone's ass. Yeah, it's awesome, and I do love the fact that yeah, the um, in Jurassic World, it just is it the Indominus Rex? Did you say Indominus Rex? Yeah, it just sees that fighting off a couple of um, raptors and a, like Chris Pratt, and it's I can have this. Yeah, <laughs> I can I'm do a- this. I just, like bitch is moving on my territory, not on my watch. So a bit of, bit of trivia here: the Tyrannosaurus Rex profile on Dino Tracker lists an updated height. Um, uh, for the dinosaur for Jurassic Park Fallen Kingdom. Uh, previously, the T-Rex was listed at 5.2 metres, and the new movie was listed at 5.5. So she grew. Still growing. Okay. Like, like you know, no 30-foot Titan, uh, 30 30-metre Titan, but... No. Yeah, it, uh, like, I guess, as they said earlier, though, that they're 70% bigger than what we thought they were at the time of... <laughs> Jurassic Park being made. Oh, Lucas, you are not ready for this. Speaking of fucking anime, in an extended version of Jurassic World Dominion, as Rexy is knocked down by the Gigantosaurus, a brief shot of the deceased animal from the prologue is shown, indicating that Rexy may have experienced a flashback to her previous life. Oh, no. In the the Jurassic period. (laughs) We're just having dinosaur anime flashbacks. Oh, dinosaur PTSD. Oh, and then behind the scenes. uh, (laughs) One, I like this one. Um, uh, The animatronic for Rexy would occasionally malfunction in the rain. And I think what uh, Mm -hmm. Phil Tippett, who was like the dinosaur supervisor, lol. Um, And um, uh, Stan Winston would say, he's like, they had to towel it off. Because like, it was made of rubber cement and it kept soaking up the water for the rain scenes. That's key. so someone's job on set was just dinosaur toweler. And they'd just know, be there, they'd just be there with shamwa, just like you know, rubbing down the dinosaur. And apparently, every now and again, it'd just shake and sneeze. <laughs> That's terrifying because that thing is huge and would have been so heavy. And the fact that it just would break and feel like it's fallen apart on set. There was also a person whose job it was is to climb inside. Oh God. They had to climb inside and fix the wires, and they said like they were at risk of being killed because it could have malfunctioned and shut its mouth and killed them, which means that that person could have been killed by a robot dinosaur. 
That's uh, one, one way to go out in life, though, isn't it? It is. Possibly the only person to have ever been killed by a robot dinosaur. So in Jurassic World, there's a sight gag where Rexy breaks through Main Street Spinosaurus skeleton, referencing the fight in Jurassic Park 3 where a Spinosaurus killed a Tyrannosaurus Rex, a scene that received a lot of backlash from fans. Because, yeah, you can't kill... The Tyrannosaurus is literally the mascot of the film. You don't kill the T-Rex. You it never kill the T-Rex. the odds or for the T-Rex, the T-Rex has plot armor and you can't kill it. And just like, yeah. Oh, no. Rexy also appears a cameo in the Spielberg movie, Ready Player One. Of course. Of course. Because that movie is just... Oh, it, it's everything wrong with making movies. It is. I can't believe Spielberg works on that. One day, yeah, that big fucking paycheck. They did, and one day we we do need to cover Ready Player One. Like, do the wiki entry on that. Cause that's going to be a good laugh. But the only other bit of like you know trivia or behind the scenes info that I want to note there is that there was a bunch of like supplementary material in the released um, to like Fallen Kingdom and Dominion, which includes what I might think is one of the coolest visuals they've made. It doesn't top. Nothing will ever top when dinosaurs ruled the earth. But there is a um, a a short called The Roar That Rules It All. <laughs> and that is where they have like a um, an ad where a T-Rex breaks into a lion enclosure and just roars at a lion. Oh. And it's just a T-Rex roaring at a lion. It's like, that's visual so fucking good. The visual's better than the movie. Mm-hmm. And I, I... That's just picking on the lions, man. That's like a little tiny baby cat compared but Lucas, to the T-Rex. Lucas, what would win? One billion T-Rexes <laughs> or one trillion lions? Or one Batman with prep time? With prep time. <sighs> the thing is, though, I bet there's some comic fan out there who's like, well, Batman would just do some bullshit to make, like, you know, the, the, meet, the meteor that killed yeah. the dinosaurs was actually Batman. <laughs> Did you know that when Batman travelled back in time and he became a pirate, he actually also caused the apocalypse and killed out all the dinosaurs? It's like, yeah. My, Batman, like, sometimes can't stop a clown with a knife. <laughs> well, fucking chances he got to stop a billion T-Rexes. But sometimes the comic book writers make it so that he could take on 1.7 billion Never T-Rexes. forget that Batman dodged undodgeable light speed lasers by doing a backflip. The ones that, like, the Flash and Superman can't dodge. Yeah, he does a backflip. He he dodges Omega beams that move at light speed by doing a backflip. That chase you at light speed. Yeah. They don't just fire off at light speed. They chase you down around corners, and Batman just did a backflip. It's like, one day, I want to meet a girl who just jerks me off as hard as comic writers and comic fans do with Batman. Fuck hell, man. He's like the thing. Christ. No one. Has, Jesus Christ! <laughs> no one writes. I didn't Batman. know it was going that way. <laughs> oh, you know what? Let's end on that. And folks at home, let us know in the comments um, which wiki won this week: Rexy the Tyrannosaurus Rex or Batman Forever? Oh, Batman Bat- Returns. And not Batman Forever. Or, you know, Danny DeVito as the penguin. <laughs> it's such a good... Oh, that man has such range. He does. He has such range. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Indeed. See you all next time. <laughs>